ready for the Word today. Why don't we stand? We're going to read and honour the Word. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. This opening line is going to do your heart good. Verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you are glad about that? How many of you are glad that He doesn't change His mind from, from this season to the next? That He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them, or ceremonial foods. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. I'm going to explain all of this in just a moment. Verse 12 of Hebrews 13. Therefore, Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered outside the gate. Say, outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to Him outside the camp, bearing His reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, firstly, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But do not forget to do good and to share. Say, to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Let's give Jesus a big shout of praise for that. Awesome. High five someone. Grab your seat. Wonderful. The book of Hebrews, I reckon the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is a masterpiece. Like the book of Romans, it's a lot in it. Um, and we actually don't know who the writer of Hebrews is. Some people say that it is Paul because he wrote so much of the New Testament. Of course, you know, it's a high chance it could be Paul. Um, others say that it's Barnabas. I think <clears throat> that, well, Orthodox belief is that we don't know who the author is. And I think that God didn't allow us to know who the author is because the writer of, uh, because the book of Hebrews actually got into the New Testament tenant uh, of Scripture, um, the canon of Scripture, because of its own content, not the reputation of the author. That there's so much in it that is just so powerful. And the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 13 says this, Jesus is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't try and get cute with it. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Don't try and dilute it with religion. Don't try and dilute it with spiritists and psychics and weird other stuff. The only way to God is through the grace that is brought about by Jesus Christ. Nothing has changed for 2,000 years, right? There was a lot of weird stuff floating around in the first century. There's a lot of weird stuff floating around now right? The Bible has always contended that only the gospel can save and change the human heart. Then the, the writer of Hebrews, because you got to understand the book of Hebrews was the audience, the intended audience were the Jewish Christians. So the way that the writer of Hebrews wrote was to use words and metaphors that the Jews understood. So there was a lot of ceremonial language. There was a lot of stuff around animal sacrifice. The Jews understood that. And so he used that very cleverly as a framework or a paradigm to describe Jesus' work. And then the writer of Hebrews uses this language to help the Jewish Christians navigate a challenge, which I think has been a challenge for the church generally. The writer of Hebrews uses inside-outside language. Because how many of you know that sometimes we take some time to figure out, are we people of the inside or are we called to be outside? So what happens in churches is that there's often two camps, right? Because we like to extremes, we like to, to nail our colors to the wall and, and, and divide ourselves. On one camp, people say that, oh, you know, now that we're Christians, we cut ourselves off from the rest of the world. We're on the inside. You've got to cut yourself off from all external influence, all of that sort of stuff. There's an elements of truth to that, but that is not the whole truth. On the other side, there is another camp that says, well, our mission is to go into all the world. Don't worry about the community within the church. Don't worry about accountability. You've been saved by Jesus. You just, you just be accountable to Jesus and you get outside into the world and preach the gospel. How many of you know that God has called us to do both? There's got to be an inside and an outside mentality. Now, undergirding the teaching in the New Testament of how to navigate this inside-outside dynamic has always been Paul's teaching about stewardship and generosity. Some of you are going, what? What does that have to do with that? Everything. I'm going to unpack that for you in Scripture. Undergirding the mentality of a believer to straddle their influence within the church as well as outside of the church is this whole construct of stewardship and generosity. The writer of the, all the writers of the New Testament understood that when it comes to money or finance, money is our life in exchangeable form. 
Do you understand that expression? It just means that it's, it's what you've got to show for all of your apprenticeship years, your, your, your work experience, the uni or TAFE course that you did. It's, it's what you've got to show for your, your working nine to five, you know, getting dressed and getting on the bus or on the train or whatever. Money is your life in exchangeable form. So it's inextricably linked. How we steward our finance, our life in exchangeable form is inextricably linked with our influence inside and outside, how we straddle the inside and outside dynamic of our Christian faith. And so today, Hey, I want to speak to you on the thought, send or spend. Send or spend. Now, the writer of Hebrews uses the crucifixion account to remind the Jewish Christians that Jesus actually did not bleed and die inside the temple gates. He bled and died outside of the gates on a hill where people were. And I know that this could potentially be disruptive theology for you if you grew up in a Christian tradition that had a crucifix inside the church and Jesus still hanging on the cross inside the church. The Bible, what, what the writer of Hebrews was trying to teach the, the early hearers was to have this mindset that Jesus died outside of the gates. There is something about the heart of a believer that understands that, yes, community within the church is absolutely critical. It's how we stay grounded. It's how we stay discipled. However, our mission is always outside of the gates. Four of you agree. Come on. The mission is always outside of the gates. There is this dynamic of the inside and then it's the outside. So when it comes to thinking outside the gates, there's always two ways that we can do that. The first predominant, most effective way, and still today, it is still the most effective way, is to say yes physically in person to sharing the gospel, to helping someone in time of need, to demonstrating the love of God through your presence, through your actions, right? That is a great relational way to participate in the Great Commission. The second way is through the giving of our finances to enable the gospel to go beyond where we can physically go. How many of you would agree that the Great Commission is widely understood out of Matthew chapter 28 as the, the Great Commission for you and I as believers to go into all of the world to preach the good news? Hello. You, are, we, are, are we theologically on the same page? There's an understanding that we ought to go into all of the world to preach the gospel. Now, on that basis alone, it is highly likely that we would all go to our graves failing that assignment, right? How can you physically go into all the world? How do I know that we're going to fail that one particular assignment? Because today in churches everywhere, people struggle to get out of bed, put their pants on one leg at a time, and come to church on time, leave alone going to all the world. Hello? Not looking at you at all, 11, I'm looking at online. It's online. They're always late for church. Like there was online late just to click on like play, right? Go into all the world. What? How can we physically go into all the world? Remember, your money is your life in exchangeable form. And I thought about where I am present. I go every month to Cambodia, to the streets. My, I have been to Tanzania, not physically, but I've been there. I've been to Bangladesh, I've been to Thailand, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to prison cells, come on, hello, I've been to alternative learning schools, I've been to university halls, I've been to high schools lately, not physically, hello, come on, why? Because my life in exchangeable form has been sent there, giving and thinking outside the gates are linked together, that's why Paul in the New Testament has always linked giving with the spreading or the work of the gospel. He says this to the church in Corinth. Now, Paul was being a little cheeky here because he was comparing the church of Corinth to the church of Macedonia. He's the leader of all of the, the churches in the known world at the time. And he's saying this in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1. It says, and now, brothers and sisters of the Corinthian church, we, our leadership team, want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, or I tell you, Corinthian church, that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. In other words, it's a little bit naughty, right? It's a little bit like me saying to Belmont that, hey, you know the Port Kennedy church? They're really, they're much more, they're much more generous than you guys in Belmont. It's like me saying to you, Mari, you know our Bunbury campus? They're much bigger givers than you. That was, that's what Paul was doing. 
The New King James Version says this, right? The translation is this, verse 3. For I bear witness that according to their ability, with the Macedonian church, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Contextually, you need to understand, the Corinthian church was a very affluent church. It was on a major trading route. Lots and lots of people lived there. It was very multicultural. People knew how to do business, mostly literate, right? So there was lots of language and culture and arts and lots of money. The Corinthian church was known for its wealth, but not known for its generosity. The Macedonian church, on the other hand, was not known for its wealth. It was a very, very poor region of the world at the time. Not known for its wealth, but Paul said they were known for their generosity. In Paul's mind, he knew which was better. Come on, I need, need a resounding amen from you. In Paul's mind, see, Paul was trying to teach this affluent Corinthian church that kingdom generosity is not about what you are able to give, but always what you are willing to give. It's not about ability, it's always about willingness. Kingdom generosity has nothing to do with your ability to give, but your willingness to give. It's a mindset. And the Macedonian church has understood that between the, the straddling the choice between sending and spending, they would rather send their money than spend their money. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it's very clear that God spoke to Moses and said, Tell the people that I am the God that gives them the power to get wealth. Do you understand that? It is God that gives you the power to get wealth. We get to choose, however, whether to send our wealth or to spend it. Matthew 6, verse 19 to 20, Jesus teaches, you know, you've got two choices. You, 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 you can look at your money. I've got a $50 bill here. It's very rare that I've got a $50 bill in my pocket. I actually, actually planned to do this. I had to get some $50 bill out of, out of the bank to make sure that I had it today. It's been a while. And you're not having it, Chrissy. It's mine. All mine. Please, do not, do not miraculously allow this $50 bill to, to disappear out of my wallet. Because they do. They just walk, just disappear out of my wallet. Like, when I open it, go, ah! I thought I had a 50 in there. What happened? I took it. Jesus says, Matthew 8, you have a decision. You can store up, spend things that on things that moth and rust and vermin can destroy. Or you can send it to have an eternal outcome and store up treasure in heaven, right? If you think about what waits for me on the other side of eternity, what waits for you on the other side of eternity, it's not the things that you spent on, but the fruit that came from what you sent your money towards. How do we know this? Paul teaches the church under Timothy's care in verse 7 of chapter 6, 1 Timothy says this, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain, you can be sure of it, we can carry nothing out. You were born naked, and you're going to die naked. <laughs> you were born with nothing. Do you think about that? You were born with nothing, and you can take Nothing out. The early church understood how this works. We don't have to deep, time to deep dive all of that. But they understood in the first century, the, the early church understood that the gospel is preached when generosity is practiced. Both of them were interlinked. How do we know that? We see it threaded right throughout New Testament Scripture. Paul says again to Timothy 1 Timothy 6, 17, command, it is the strongest word that can be translated out of the Greek. Command, not suggest, not teach not imply. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Wow, man, the Western church needs to learn this. Which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Here's the second time again. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share in this way, this way of being generous, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for what is to come in eternity. Make sense to you? So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. If you want the true Zoe life, the true life that Jesus died and rose again for you to experience in this life and the next, understand that God created you to be a sender, not a spender. Paul didn't say to Timothy, um, you know how, you know, like right now, um, cost of living is really, really high in Galatia. And also like the church in Ma churches in Macedonia, cost of living is really high. I suggest you don't, you don't speak about money, please. Because, you know, uh, it, it's just going to offend everyone. So why don't you just talk about loving God, loving people? No, he says, come on, those who are rich. 
Come on, those are rich. Some of you are thinking, PK, this is the wrong time. Do you not read the room? This is the wrong time to preach about this. No, it's always the right time to teach the Word of God. Have you not read the news, PK? I have read the news, but I've read the Bible more. I suggest you do the same. So many of us scroll through our news feed, getting our gospel from the news feed when the Bible has been, come on, the Bible has been helping us to navigate what it's like to live in this life, straddling the inside and the outside. Generosity has always been inextricably linked with the spread of the gospel, with the gospel being preached. Paul says to Timothy, command those who are rich in this world to be generous. I have no shame in preaching this sermon at all because Australia, Australians are some of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest people on the planet. There are many different surveys and indices out there that that rate wealth per capita. But here is, if you want to talk about the median Australian adult, Credit Suisse's global report said this, the median Australian adult finished 2021 with their net worth, this this just came out um, in the middle of this year, with a net worth of $273,900 US, making them richer than the comparable resident of any other country. So I want to remind you today, a bit of healthy perspective. Is that okay? A bit of healthy perspective. If you today had the luxury of being concerned about how the climate is changing and about all the various issues of equality and social justice and how we should all be recycling everything, all from the privacy of your under two-year-old iPhone or Android device, made from entirely non-sustainable materials, which you don't really want to talk about, with 4G or 5G internet on a living room couch, made cheaply by the very people you have conflated outrage for in what you call heinous employment conditions, in a house with running water, electricity, and food in a fridge, then you're wealthy! If you have the luxury of all of that, you're wealthy! If your chronic complaint right now is that the price of petrol is too high, you clearly have one or two or three cars in your garage, you are wealthy. Come on, you guys not convinced. If you access public health care in the last five years, you showed up to ED, you had, you had I don't know, pain in your gut or something like that, you had a, some operation, some procedure, something in the public health system where you had to pay either next to nothing or just a little bit of something, you are wealthy. Come on, are you out there? We are some of the wealthiest, we are some of the wealthiest people in the world, regardless of whether you you measure some indices, some people say the Scandinavian countries have it over Australia, some people say the Swiss have it more than Australians, whatever it is, we're at least in the top five of the most wealthy people in the world. Then why is it that we lead the way in mental illness issues? If spending makes you happy, then why is it that we lead the way in skyrocketing depression rates? Maybe the enemy's lying to us this whole time. Maybe on the inside of you, God created you to be a sender, not a spender. Maybe the world has ingrained you and trapped you to thinking that the great way to happiness at this time of the year is to spend more when all along the Bible's taught us to send more. Come on, I need somebody to shout amen this morning. There is something in the heart of God to remind us that He is the God that gives us the power to get wealth. And that is, is, I think, I think the Western church needs to awaken to how wealthy we are. It, we, it, I'm a migrant child, so I have an appreciation for how blessed I am to live in this country. If you're Australian by birth <coughs> and you've grown up here, let me suggest to you, go travel. Go see the world. Go to a third world country. Go to one of those mission trips. If you've never been out of Australia before, go see what the rest of the world has to live like. You'll come back being 10 times more grateful, realizing how, how blessed you actually are. And that wealth, that wealth, we get to choose whether we send it or we get to spend it. Paul was trying to disciple the Corinthian church. They were known for their wealth, but not their generosity. So he's trying to shape their thinking in his second letter to them. He teaches more on generosity. He was really hammering these guys. Like, you know, he was trying to shape their thinking, this very progressive, modern, wealthy, affluent city of Corinth. And he uses the analogy of seed because it was an agricultural time in human history where everyone understood that seed was a very important kind of currency. But seed is money, essentially. It's life in exchangeable form for people back then. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10. Now he supplies seed to the sower. Say seed to the sower. And bread for food. Say bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched 
in every way so that you can be generous. Say generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So here is Paul. He likens money to seed, right? Seed to seed. Whether you decide that, that this seed is to be sent or sowed into the ground for a future harvest or seed turned into bread for eating right now, that decision is completely yours. It's completely your own. I think for so long, we've taught ourselves that the way to happiness is to turn seed into bread. And we wonder why we always feel like we never have enough. If you want to know what is the heart of God for you, look at what God chooses to bless and increase. Put that verse up again, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10. Put it up on the screen, please. What does Paul say God increases? Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of bread? What does it say? Not a trick question. Your store of? If you want to know what God wants to increase in your life next year, it's not bread, but it's seed. Why? Because he knows. How many watches can you wear? How many kicks can you? You only got two feet. Some of us have one, right? How many pairs of shoes can you wear? I can only wear one pair of pants at a time. Come on, are you out there? I can only look at one screen at a time. I only have two eyes, right? How much bread? And we, we spend our time asking God, pray, God, give us more bread. We're all along God saying, well, dude, I want to give you more seed. We have a decision on whether our seed gets turned to seed for sowing, sending, or seed for spending, making bread, right? The reason why Paul was teaching this is because he was trying to shape the Corinthian church into this understanding. This radically transformed my life and the way that, you got to understand, I, I, I studied about money. I have two degrees in this stuff. I know how this, these, these things work in the world, but I also have studied the Bible. And I tell you what, the Bible trumps the world every single time. And this is, this is what Paul is trying to shape in the heart of the Corinthian church. He's, he's really saying to them, when you, when you send your money, you tell your money what to do. But when you spend your money, your money tells you what to do. You're following this? Let me give you an example. Next weekend for our reach offering, we get to say to the 50, $100, $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, whatever God has placed in your heart to give, you get to say to it, you, money, I'm commanding you to go to Tanzania. I'm commanding you to go to Bangladesh. I'm commanding you to go to Congo. I'm commanding you to go into the prisons in Cambodia. I'm commanding you, come on, to go to the high schools. I'm commanding you. I am commanding you. I get to tell my money what to do. But when I choose to spend it, money tells me what to do. Use me, show me off, insure me, keep me, polish me, maintain me. Hello? How many of you bought something really, really valuable recently? Like really, really valuable. And then it kept you up at night figuring out how you can hide it. Secure it. And then you bought all of the, all of the ancillary things that come along with it to keep it safe, like a safe. And you forgot the combination, you stressed out. Right? The next day you're on the phone adjusting your insurance policy. Talking to a machine. Gladly. Why? Because whenever you spend your money, your money tells you what to do. Obsess on me. Think about me. Read reviews on me. Oh, man, I'm talking to a church now. Hello. Come on, you guys are getting so quiet at 11 a.m. Online's going crazy right now in their bathrobe. Just going, yeah, preach a PK. This message is not about asking you to throw a bit of coin into missions offering next week. I'm going after your heart. I'm discipling your way of thinking about who you are. Do you understand that? There, there is there's something at this time of the year, maybe it's just, it's just the, 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 the Spirit of God in me just, just, that just gets annoyed at the fact that Christmas has just been hijacked by a different spirit. A spirit of this age has come to hijack this complete. God has created us to be senders, not spenders. And I want to encourage you guys today, when you think about your life, think about the wealth, the, the relative wealth that the Lord has given you. You're not responsible for the outcome of the money you send. That's God's business. But you are responsible for the obedience of outworking the sending. 
Let me tell you a story. In 1979, there was a quite an influential church in Melbourne that had what we would call an old-fashioned style missions offering. They uh, had cast this vision for some local and global sort of missions initiatives. And one of the cutting edge at the time missions ideas that they have locally for them was to outreach to local universities in the Melbourne area uh, for overseas students. You've got to understand, this was 1979. The White Australia policy had only been abolished in 1975, so most churches did not have ethnic minorities. And that, their heart was that, you know, we were starting to see some, some, some Asian migration particularly and, and migration from, from different parts of the world come in to Melbourne to study as our, as our doors societally have begun to open. And this church had, a, had a, I believe, a God idea where they thought, wouldn't it be amazing to preach the gospel to overseas students so that when they went back to their home countries, they would take the gospel with them. Incredible, right? Cutting edge back then. Back then was four years out of the white Australia policy. Most churches didn't want to touch ethnic minorities. And this church decided, okay, so it was that that, that season where they sowed, where where the the pastor at the time cast his vision, we're going to take up this mission offering. So it was allocated a whole bunch of different outreach projects and all that sort of stuff. But one of these was to this local university's outreach where they would try and and, and evangelize to, to overseas students. Now, the way to love overseas students is always to love on them well, be kind to them, and to feed them. There was one young overseas student at the time that was about 20 years old, and uh, he'd come from Asia, and and he was studying, he was alone, a long line of Buddhists in, in his family, and very lost, and he'd heard the sound of some singing in a lecture theater in this university in Melbourne. And drawn by the sound of singing, he he came and sticks his head in and sits at the back of the university lecture hall and hears for the first time in his life this gospel about Jesus, how he died and he rose again and forgave us of our sins and this grace of God and never heard of it before. His life was radically transformed and him alongside many, many other um, students from all different parts of Asia in that season in this fruitful ministry of this church for universities, saw many, many people get saved, and they continued to bus overseas students from the university campuses into church every Sunday, mentoring them, discipling them. Three years later, this student that got saved in that lecture hall goes back to Malaysia, where he's from, and came under intense persecution by his own family. One of his older brothers, much older brothers, gave him the hardest time, and really, really persecuted him and for the shame that he brought to the family and, you know, having converted out of Buddhism and into Christianity. And after six months, 12 months of just relentlessly sharing the good news, this older brother actually comes to faith. Him and his whole family get saved in the early 80s. Just a few years after that, in the late 80s, this whole family migrates to Australia, the very nation that sowed to give the gospel to them. Incredible. That family was a mom, dad, and two kids, and those two kids grew up in a local church. The youngest of that family, the boy, ended up pastoring a church called Nations Church. (laughs) As I reflected back on our family's Christian journey, we don't have a Christian heritage, but I'm not too proud to say that I am the product of someone else's missional work, sometimes we think that people just get saved on their own. They can just be left on their own. We don't need to give. We don't need to help. We don't need to bring. But I can tell you now, if you actually think about your Christian heritage, somebody somewhere along the line decided, I'm going to sow. I'm going to give. I'm going to bring. I'm going to send rather than spend. I'm so grateful. Now, It's been many iterations of pastors since that first pastor cast that vision in Melbourne. It's four and a half decades later. Many of the people that gave in that church are now going to be with Jesus, I'm sure. But I stand here, you are here today as a fruit. Multiple iterations and additions in the future, obviously. But I'm so glad that they sent rather than spent. Here's the clincher. Just two weeks ago, I accepted an invite to stand on the stage of that church 
where the pastor many, many pastors ago stood on that same stage, cast a vision. They don't know this story. I think I should tell them. Do you reckon? <laughs> they invited me because I'm the pastor of Nation Church, not because I actually have this story, but I'm actually thinking, I should tell this, share this with them, right? There's so many generations later, I don't have a time machine, but some days I imagine myself going back into the time machine, back to the future style. <laughs> Dark! Marty McFly. All right. <laughs> Let's not get sidetracked. I wish I could go back there in time and say to the pastor, what you're doing there, thank you so much for sending rather than spending. I'm Ken Lee from 2022. Don't let that freak you out. <laughs> but this is what this has done for my life. I wish I could do that. But we can't. What we can do now is determine that we're going to be senders, not spenders. That's all we can do is determine that in this day, in this hour, that we are sending rather than spending. Next week, we're going to be taking up our reach offering as we do this time every year. So close to Christmas, everybody always says, PK, you are crazy. It's like financial suicide. Like you'll never take anything up. People don't want to give. I just want to disciple you to be senders, not spenders. I want to preach the word and leave it to you to decide who you want to be. But the same weekend last year, we gave $230,184.54. How awesome is that? So good. I thank God for that 54 cents, whoever gave that. See, the Lord is testing me. I like round numbers. It must have been one of, the, well, one of our kids, actually, in, in the envelope from a parent that had a few two, three-cent coins <laughs> left in the drawer. It's a mad rush on that day. Quick, quick! It's reach offering day, we forgot! That's how we'd roll. But directly through local initiatives, almost 4,600 people got to hear the gospel. 4,600 through local initiatives across all our different campuses, through global outreach, directly, directly reached 2,275. There are many more indirectly. They're families too. 6,873 people were reached with the gospel. We don't know on this side of eternity what eternal impact the money we send is going to do. But I'm wondering, on the other side of eternity, when we go be with Jesus, whether we'd realize that back in 2022 there was some young uni student that came from South Africa or Korea or the Philippines or Thailand or the Ukraine, heard the gospel through one of our university outreaches at Uni Hall, took the gospel back to where they came from. I don't know. Could we possibly be raising the next Prime Minister of Cambodia through our giving? Could we possibly be preaching the gospel to the next senator or legislation maker somewhere in some high school somewhere around this area? Come on, are you out there? We don't know that. What we do know is that we'd rather, God would rather us send than spend. I need a resounding amen from somebody. Last year, we took up 230,000. I reckon this year, come on, Myri, online, I reckon we could take up 300,000. The borders have opened again. There's much work to do. We're going to be planting a campus in Ireland. I want to see that most unreached English-speaking country in the world be reached for the gospel. Come on. <laughs> Next Sunday, we do this again. This is not your tithes and offerings. That's, that's for the house. We do that. Be faithful to do that. This is not building our future. That's for your legacy. The reach offering is for the harvest. The reach offering is for the harvest. I want to read you Hebrews chapter 13 again, out of the Message Bible. Musos, you can join me. It says this out of verse 13. Eugene Peterson writes it like this. I love it. He says, let's go outside where Jesus is, where the action is. Not trying to be privileged insiders, but taking our share in the abuse of Jesus. This insider world is not our home. Wow. That's a good reminder, isn't it? We have our eyes peeled for the city about to come. Let's take our place outside with Jesus, no longer pouring out the sacrificial blood of animals, but pouring out sacrificial praises from our lips to God in Jesus' name. Verse 18, make sure you don't take things for granted and go slack in working for the common good. Share what you have with others. God takes particular pleasure in acts of worship, a different kind of sacrifice that take place in kitchen and workplace and on the streets. I don't know about you, I love the fact that we've got a Myri, we've got a phenomenal facility. But it's not just for us. I love the fact as a migrant child, I can say that we live in some of the most affluent conditions, standards of living globally. 
in the world, in human history. We've never been this rich. Never been this rich. Yet the world tells us that there's not enough. You haven't got enough. You need more. More is going to make you happy. My heart for us is today that we awaken to the fact that we've all been called to be senders, not spenders. Is that helpful to you?